Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our final event for the Efficiency Project, this European Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Action. I am Dorothy Duncan, and I work at the University of Bergen as a researcher in responsible research and innovation. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce on stage the project coordinator, our colleague Tomasz Wadosz from the uh, Aqua Tech, uh, Agrobala Tech uh, Group in Marfa. So please, Tomasz, uh, tell us a little bit more and give us an overview of the research and innovation action. Thank you, Dorothy. I don't know, maybe I can start with. Uh, so thank you, Dorothy, and uh, welcome to the our final so the IOC access study started with one time at all, more than five years ago, when we decided with Dominic and with the North India to join our forces and submit a proposal to work with for the European Union you know, in 2020 uh, Togba. And uh, we did have the concert soon, where uh, our aim was to, to represent uh, the industry, the companies, the science, and also the NGO sector of the uh, of the aquaculture, so well the project still has uh, help. We have still help because we still have one month from the project. Uh, we have uh, sixteen partners in the project. My from these are SMEs. We have four research institutes, two universities, and we have the NCC food, uh, which is representing the the NGO sector of the, the aquaculture in the in the project of the cluster. Uh, and uh, in terms of the, the, the countries and aquaculture production areas, we covered uh, the whole uh, Europe, I see. We covered the main species of the aquaculture in Europe, like the uh, Atlantic salmon, sea seabream, and uh, the freshwater uh, aquaculture, like uh, trout and, uh, and African catfish. Uh, but we also work with, uh, with species which are important for the world aquaculture to feed the world and which are which present important role in the in the aquaculture development of the world, like the tilapia and uh, Asian seabirds, for example, which are emerging uh, real species. Because uh, the concept of the project was not just develop something from the European aquaculture, but develop. Uh, the potential of the European aquaculture to export technologies for the for the whole world. Uh, as usual, we're in the horizon uh, uh, 2020 uh, goals, the project uh, aimed to solve all the problems of the aquaculture industry in one project. Uh, but uh, so we go a little bit with everything. But our main focus uh, in the efficiency project, uh, we can say that it was the waste from aquaculture at the environment environmental conditions. One of our key key areas in there was the feed sustainability, efficiency of the feeding and alternative feeding gradient. But we also were able to mitigate the climate change impact. Uh, and and uh, also we 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 are uh, we have some results in, in terms of the more uh, economic uh, production methods and uh, the social acceptance of the of the aquaculture. The structure of uh, of the project uh, was arranged uh, and then around the uh, five main main pillars, which uh, are in the, the orange box. Uh, and the little guys that uh, we we wanted to uh, work with the uh, new technologies. As, as Bridget many mentioned in her introduction, we wanted to introduce the aquaculture flow points of uh, technologies uh, in the existing technologies, and we, at the same time work with the feed uh, development, feeding system uh, development, but do this on a way uh, that uh, can support the sustainability and the removal of the responsible research initiative and uh, innovation uh, in the project. And uh, so, uh, uh, in uh, the project, which uh, you see today, more uh, and uh, we hope that this uh, this works in the wise area of project raising. So, uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, I wish you a nice uh, and beautiful day and the whole consortium. And I hope you will. Uh,
in Joelia and uh, for you for, for your presentations about our project. Thank, Thank you, David. So much, so much. And we're going to hear from you as well later when we get back to the Hungarian story. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague Inman Sanchez from uh, Nelfat in Barcelona. Circularity is really important for sustainable aquaculture, and Inman's been working exactly on this topic. So, please, Inma, yes, give you an introduction on the topic of circularity circular economy. Most of you already know about this, but basically, the circular economy is the model of action where we should um, uh, reduce waste and we should uh, extend the, the life cycle of the product. Uh, but we uh, think about aquaculture. I would like to give some feedback from you at the um, uh, start the presentation. And uh, so, just take a picture or scan the code, let's say, and, and provide a few words uh, about how do you think that the circular economy uh, is embedded or uh, is connected to aquaculture. Yes. People from home, I think that they can also provide feedback. Yes, 30, 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. Regulation, good business, smart, slack. Okay. Do we have more feedback? Okay, otherwise we can go to back to the presentation. Um actually we we made the same question two years ago and I can see some um th something that is in common that is probably the sustainability. So the sustainability is very connected to the circularity and we have to think uh to build and find the circular uh aquaculture to be sustainable. Uh, probably we make we have to make some effort to ensure that the circular aquaculture is sustainable enough. Um, and with the circularity, well, the, we can see the circularity in the technical cycle is more or less easy to follow uh, a material that can be a uh, manufactured, can be used, can be after the end of life, it can be collected, and it can be used again and uh, 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 can be treated in a recycled system or in a reuse system. But if we look into the biological cycle, it will sometimes the cascades are not the same. Um, so we can use again and again the uh, biological tool, but in the end, the um, destruction of biological feedstocks would be restorative as well. So the, we have a, a, a big difference, let's say, between biological and the biological materials. And aquaculture is actually in the biological. Uh, if we look into the, the aquaculture, just some very basic observation, we can see that the feed is uh, sometimes fully uh, used. We hope so, but uh, the thing is that some of the feed is lost. And on the end, we're not well. Uh, but then, uh, what about if we talk about nutrients instead of waste? Um, so the simpler aquaculture could factor uh, the nutrients that are used and nutrients that are lost. So probably we could change the paradigm and not talk about waste, but talk about nutrients. Uh, in the traditional system, like the IOPA in Asia, for instance, we can see a circular output uh, where the feces and amino feed is uh, are taken by species. This is not new in other countries that uh, we are promoting uh, more and more the IFP as a circular um, as a circular production system in Europe. Uh, if we look at the rust system main it seems like circular item in the sense that some of the waste have a circulate by drum filter, uh, some uh, uh, biofilter and then uh, we can use again tanks. Or maybe it's circular uh, in the sense that they can trade the streams from aquaculture and also they can create value uh, opportunity and create a business opportunity to use that more efficiently. We have also 
no te no te lo explicará con cuánto ya ni se puede sostener un producto así que no puede y no tiene producción las irrigate water so the runoff from system can be used so the principles of circular economy are perhaps already embedded in our agriculture system but there is a strong need to um, provide tools or appropriate technologies so the need for increasing up in the dominant production system so in this case uh, we are starting efficiency project and um, we create a circular pollution level uh, I mean for you uh, recycle recovery device but let's say weekend and so at the real one in the sense that agriculture is um co it's coordinated with other sectors to provide uh, synergy and at the global scale uh, providing high products uh, that can uh, improve Sustainable or ensure the sustainability of our country. And the circularity is a key aspect of the project in the sense that we are moving from a linear uh, person to a circular. The basic idea of, of circularity in efficiency is that algae and these can be cultivated with, uh, with um, great streams from fish farms. Uh, this algae and this can uh, be uh, formulated into feeds or can be in other conditions. And then we show that circularity should be measurable, uh, should be a measurable attribute, and we start to see how uh, what, uh, what to measure, measure and how to measure the circularity. And then we show that um, we should measure how well the Things that we were doing in the means perform the context of the circular economy. We also uh, um, agreed that we have to ensure materials flows of the story of the system. And, and then uh, the started to see how we could quantify uh, the inputs coming from virgin materials and materials that. Um, and see the components that are collected. And then we should measure the efficiency of the recycling processes and use cycle. So if the process, the six process developing efficiency period, we identify different waste streams and then uh, opportunities for valorizing this waste stream, not only for waste but also for Water. This is particularly relevant uh, for the last system where we can collect that. Um, and then we identify key parameters we monitor to measure quality. One of them for the raw material flow that we can uh, also in the feed formula, uh, the process of restorative materials uh, that can from the use of recycled sources. And finally, the key aspect the utility. Uh, of the feed that is um, that has a circular formula. If we don't have the utility of the feed, then we don't have circular principles uh, in the process. So the challenge was to provide evidence metrics, uh, evidence metrics, uh, and so that we had to develop a work for assess with the circularity of aquaculture. And then we started to elaborate on some key indicators that um, in the end they led us to develop and demonstrate um, with figures that when we have nitrogen assimilation we have higher nitrogen assimilation we have higher circularity but we should do them through figures through the, the, the key indicators now then we have been contributing our things years we have contributing to the circular agriculture, providing a fresh approach uh, to a common definition for the sector, sorry. And uh, we have identified and criticized uh, circular feed formulas. Um, we have studied a more efficient feeding system. Uh, we have um, developed a 
uh, circularity application framework for innovative algorithm groups. And in the end, we have provided an evidence-based metrics for assessing circularity. We have been um, focusing on four uh, main indicators uh, to evaluate the linearity of the feed, the nutrients recovery, the material circularity, and the zero waste attributes. And we wanted to go further. Three years ago, we, we saw that there is nothing on, uh, on the sector um, related to a common approach for circular, uh, circularity definition. And we started to work together with other people from other projects. Uh, it was a big um, collaboration between many people in, in across Europe and all the people from out from Europe. And we elaborated on a policy recommendation document providing some uh, ideas to start with definition, uh, some ideas and, and recommendation to, uh, uh, to evaluate the circularity and, and, and some strategies to tackle the, the regulation challenges. So if you want to know more about these indicators, we are having our a waste to value workshop tomorrow moderated by my colleague Monse. So you are more than welcome to participate tomorrow and and be aware of this. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Inma. So what yes. Uh, again, tomorrow we're, we'll be in the uh, same time, same place here in the morning for that waste to value workshop. Uh, one of the biggest innovations in efficiency is something we call IBOS. So I have my colleague uh, Franck Legal from EGM in France to tell us a little bit more about that. Hello, thank you. Good morning, I'm Franck Legal from, uh, from EGM and I'm going to introduce the IBOS, which is let's say, the IT platform uh, being used in the efficiency project or developed in the efficiency project. Uh, maybe to start when we want to deploy such a platform, first question is, okay, what is it? What do we want to, to, to answer to? And uh, we had a number of discussions with uh, stakeholders in the project and outside of the project to identify the default needs. I said nothing really new, but always good to, to step them down again. That, okay, we need to, to reduce uh, the inputs in terms of food, in terms of energy. We want to reduce waste because waste is waste. Uh, in March or less, what we can do with waste, but if we can reduce them from the beginning, that's always better. Obviously, we want to increase fish uh, production in quantity and in quality. Both aspects are quite important. And for that, we need to, to improve the, the process planning and uh, all system maintenance, stock availability, and looking at the whole uh, value chain in, in the sector and overall of, uh, and of course uh, in total looking also at the reduction in environmental footprint. How we do that uh, is using data. So we need, we need data and from data we will be able to, to build rules and uh, help informed decision uh, through some, uh, some rules and, and recommendations. Data, uh, there are a lot of data. Quite often we think about sensor data, IoT data, which is providing information about water quality, uh, the equipment and so on, but it's not only this. It's also feedback from the farmer, so it can be from farms and so on. So it's really a lot of different data. It's also data from the suppliers, which is providing the, the, the food with all information on the, on, on the food sticker and so on. So this has to be collected from a number of different ways, from the sensors, uh, from forms, from online interfaces, and so on. And once we get all this data, then we can start building on rules. And it's not only about uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, but it's also about uh, capturing the expert knowledge from the, from the field. So we, we have to, to allow these two uh, interactions in the, in the platform. And a number of different algorithms can then once this is achieved, uh, be developed, and the next presentation will tell us a bit more on that. So how we do did uh, tackle uh, that in the project? Uh, if we want to develop uh, an IT system, so as I said, we have a number of <coughs> solution providers for sensors, for the systems, for the hardware, for the software, and so on. What is my best approach for that uh, uh, as a farmer? Um, first is, okay, I will look independently to each different vendors which is selling me the perfect solution and I will install all of them in my farm. Okay, everything will work fine, but then, okay, everything will be in silos. So I won't be able to easily exchange information from one solution to the, to the other. 
So next, I could go to a big vendor saying, okay, I can do both and I will integrate the whole thing. That's perfect because then I will have the whole solution working together, all functions being interacting. But then again, one issue is locking because I'm only with that vendor. So what if I want to go to another vendor that may be a competitor that will not go, uh, will not like to, 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 to cooperate on that. So the approach we took in the project was working on interoperability, saying that we have different solutions from different vendors. We can say this one is better than this one. It really depends on the case. But what is important is that each solution will be able to interact with one another through interoperable interfaces. And this allows making a, a, an ecosystem. Uh, so this is technically, I won't go too much into the, the technical details, but basically we, we have a cloud which can be in the cloud, but can be on premise, depending on where you want to put your data. We will have data producers, as I said, uh, sensors, but not, not only, that will provide data. We'll have data consumers that will make use of that data. It can be the farmer looking at dashboard, but it can be also a feeder, a pump, and so on, which is being controlled by some data coming down. And obviously, we'll have data processors. So things which will get data, run some algorithm, provide feedback. Oh, that's a good time to feed. Oh, stop feeding now, and so on, and so on. We didn't want to Invent, reinvent the wheel. So what we went, we did, we went to Etsy, which is one of the uh, three official uh, European standardization institute. We took one of their specification, which has the ugly name of NGSA LD, but which is meant to really allow exchange of information across different domains. Because aquaculture is aquaculture, but it's using information from the water domain, from the energy domain, from the transport domain, and so on and so on. So we need to exchange data across these different domains. So, idea and what we would need to push, and uh, I hope this afternoon we'll have the opportunity to discuss this further in the, in the workshop where we'll have round tables, is, uh, okay, we provide a solution which is multi-vendor, so no vendor locking, it's quite open, uh, extensible across the value chain. In the project, obviously, we can't answer everything, so we have to focus on a particular aspect, but this can be extended across the, the value chain. With innovation capabilities, if you want to add new modules, new emerging topics, you can because there are these inter um, interoperable interfaces. And uh, this afternoon, we'll be pleased to, to present you a bit more into the, uh, or to enter a bit more in the detail of what we, what we did. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Frank. So Frank just gave us an overview of the infrastructure and the ins and outs of iBoss. But now we're going to show you iBoss in action. And this is uh, one of the really cool demos that we've been doing in Greece with our colleagues uh, Dimitra and Nikos from the Hellenic Marine Research Center in Crete. So you guys are going to show us how this has all worked in practice. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, following what uh, Tamas uh, introduced as the general objective of the project and what Frank present as part <coughs> of the iBoss platform, I'm going to present you together with Dimitra, with my brother Dimitra, uh, the work we did uh, in Greece <coughs> towards an intelligent feeding system to control uh, <coughs> uh, the feeding in marine cages. <coughs> I'm going to start a little bit with what uh, Frank said uh, our target got, was from the beginning to provide a decision support system in order to reduce cost, <coughs> to reduce waste and environmental footprint, and to improve <coughs> process planning, st stock system, and, and etc. Uh, exactly uh, similar graph as Frank, we need data and we expect to provide tools. But uh, the general idea that uh, <coughs> we wanted to provide tools using principles of what it is called recently precision farming. And this is more or less uh, what it is also said uh, aquaculture for uh, approach. Always when uh, we want to work with fish, we have to consider uh, some uh, parameters, some things that we have to respect. And this is the species specific requirement of the fish and also the species specific behaviors of the fish. Of course, we need to understand first the behaviors in order to respect them. And we have obviously uh, need to, uh, to respect the welfare of the fish. And for this, we need appropriate methods to monitor the behavior and to determine the fish requirements and to link with any possible husbandry activities. In other words, <coughs> we need to find a way to allow fish to talk to us. And speaking about feeding, uh, the main question is how, how we can feed smart. 
And we know that feeding has uh, different uh, drivers, the environmental conditions, the developmental phase of the individuals, the fish status, and the metabolic state of uh, the fish. We have several tools to monitor <coughs> the environmental parameters. We have uh, methods to estimate the growth and that is, uh, the development. We have models to predict the metabolic state. And we have behavioral observations until now to, <coughs> to give us an indication of how fish are and the general condition. And the main question in this project was how we can use this feeding behavior to achieve a more intelligent uh, feeding strategy. In other words, uh, the questions to answer was can we optimize feeding <coughs> by understanding when the fish are satiated or close to satiation or when the fish are hungry? And can we correlate, <coughs> correlate the, the, the swimming activity of the fish to define this uh, satiation or hunger levels? Uh, when we feed a fish, particularly in the Mediterranean, we have some uh, observations. And uh, you can see here in this video uh, what I'm seeing. Uh, it's obvious that the fish present a high density. Uh, they start having a circular motion. They have an increased activity, most probably related to higher speed. And they, <coughs> we also observe that the fish approach the surface during feeding. So, what are the potential indicators that we can measure out of these behavioral indicators? We can measure the distribution in length, we can measure the cohesion of the group, the change in speed, and the directionality polarization. <coughs> these are the technologies that were available, or we wanted to use, better to say, in, uh, in the frame of high efficiency. IBOS has been described uh, before by Frank, and Fishtalk to me is a technology that allows us to have a continuous data collection from the fish. <coughs> fish behavior, in this case, that I'm presenting here, and to integrate uh, with other technologies in order to have a system of continuous observation that allows us to have a continuous picture of what is going on in the farm. So I'm going to show you a little bit how we implement this fish talk to me in our case in the in Mediterranean. We use environmental sensors, obviously, and then we have a combination of tools for monitoring feeding behavior, like cameras, echo sounders, telemetry tags, and so on. And we want to investigate <coughs> different characteristics of swimming behavior and its variation, variations in relation to feeding. <coughs> we wanted to select appropriate parameters to serve as decision indicators and to want, wanted to quantify uh, thresholds uh, to, to decide on these uh, uh, parameters and to transfer all these values to the IBOS. Uh, schematically, it's what uh, it showed here, the fish, uh, the, the different parameters, that we collect, and then the IBOS cloud and the decision support there. Where we did <coughs> all this work, uh, at, at, at HCMR, uh, we have a pilot farm uh, in Greece, uh, uh, in Crete, uh, in the Bay of Suda. Uh, we have a farm close to uh, uh, a commercial port, and this is how the farm looks like. We have been using a circular cage of 40 meters in perimeter, uh, meters in perimeter and 9 meter, meters in depth. I know that this is not a commercial cage, but it is as close as possible to a commercial. It's a pilot scale application. And we run <coughs> two or three production cycles using sea, a European sea bass as uh, 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 species of, of interest and uh, uh, species to work with. We use all this <coughs> period in order to develop first applications that allow us to observe what is going on and then to <coughs> collect also the required information that uh, were uh, required for us uh, to work. What are, what are the tools that we have been using? <coughs> Environmental sensors for live streaming, uh, submerged cameras, echo sounders, and then <coughs> telemetry equipment. Uh, this is the schematic representation of the setup that we had with <coughs> the environmental sensors in, uh, uh, in different depths. The camera, the echo sounder, the feeder, and then everything uh, with wireless transmission to the IBOS. It's an easy setup, <coughs> straightforward installation, no real operational problems apart from some network failures which uh, <coughs> mostly related to the bad weather condition, which is something that uh, we have, we anticipated and we could uh, tolerate. And I'm coming <coughs> actually to uh, what are the data that have been collected. And I'm going to start with environmental monitoring. <coughs> Two uh, partners, Oxygard and BioCyanor, provided us with sensors. <coughs> and we had an online data collection, as you can see here. 
and all this data were transferred come on, to the IBOS <coughs> that uh, our colleagues from EGM has uh, implemented. So uh, we had solved somehow the environment uh, part of the problem. And then <coughs> uh, I'm going to start uh, uh, pre presenting some of the results we have about the behavioral monitoring. As I said, we ran several trials <coughs> in order to, uh, to achieve this. Obviously, we are not going to present you all the information and all, all the data that we have collected, but uh, we, have, we have selected some of this data to, to present with Dimitra. I'm going to start <coughs> with the acoustic telemetry. Acoustic, acoustic telemetry, for, uh, everybody knows that. We have some tags that are <coughs> um, implanted on the fish, and then we can monitor individual uh, behavior of the fish in the cages. We have <coughs> done this uh, implantation, and come on. We have studied the effect of the implantation on the behavior of the fish so that we are sure when we transfer the fish in the cage that we observe the actual behavior of the fish and not the effect of the, uh, of, of the tagging. And <coughs> then we study uh, how the fish behave. And we came up with two interesting results. Uh, first, uh, <coughs> the first result is what we call food anticipatory activity. And <coughs> you can see here in, uh, in blue that uh, after uh, sunrise, you have the fish react to the environmental uh, uh, change by increasing their activity, uh, anticipating for food. And this is something that we knew from the biology of the, of the species. The, the, uh, it's a species specific characteristics of the sea bass, sea bass that it has this behavior <coughs> that uh, they are foraging in the morning and also in the afternoon. So we have seen this uh, food anticipator activity, but also we have seen uh, a food anticipatory positioning, as you can see in these two graphs. And you see here a concentration of the fish and two time slots in the morning and uh, just uh, before uh, the sunset. That is again correlated with um, uh, the in, in strict characteristics of the species. These results <coughs> gave us the first uh, topic of the first idea of how the sea bus is behaving. Uh, <coughs> it has been in collaboration with NORS, with our colleagues in NORS. And uh, last week, uh, the paper came out with this information. Now, uh, <coughs> Dimitra is going to continue with uh, some more interesting results on uh, the feeding behavior. Hello. Uh, to understand how the fish uh, <coughs> change their behavior around feeding times, uh, we designed a series, a long-term experiment, where we changed different parameters, <coughs> feeding parameters. Uh, these were the feeding uh, frequency, the feeding time, and the feeding quantity. And we analyzed all this data by using a model that we had developed, a system we had developed previously, that uh, help us, helps us to track the fish. The first behavior parameter we tested was the speed of the group. And here you can see how the, how the speed changes in time uh, for different feeding quantities. The normal reduced uh, when there is overfeeding and there is no, when there is no feeding. Uh, on the vertical uh, line, we see when feeding starts, and the green bar shows us, uh, down here, shows us the duration of the feeding. Uh, what we can see from this graph, uh, we can extract three, three things. First, we can see that we can define a possible speed threshold <coughs> over which there is a, an increased activity related to feeding. And this is shown here in the, in the horizontal uh, line in the middle. Uh, the other thing we can see is that uh, there is an, a difference in the duration of the activity, of the increased activity, for the different uh, feeding schedules. And uh, the last thing we see is that there is difference in the, in the symmetry of the behavior. What I mean with, with this is that if you look in this uh, plot, uh, we see that the speed gradually increases just before feeding and gradually decreases uh, immediately after feeding. Uh, showing that there is a symmetry in the behavior around the feeding time, uh, when the feeding starts. 
Uh, this is not the case for the reduced and the overfeeding scenario where we see an asymmetry around the feeding time uh, in both cases but in a different uh, direction. So we wanted to quantify this asymmetry, we found a way to quantify this asymmetry and this is what we show you in this graph. Uh, the y-axis shows the, the asymmetry that is taking place for the different uh, feeding scenarios, the different lines are the different feeding scenarios, scenarios and I want that you focus on the blue line uh, which is the, behavior, the asymmetry seen uh, when we have normal feeding. This line is, quite, is horizontal uh, and it's close to zero, suggesting that there is an asymmetry around the feeding time, as we saw also, uh, there is a symmetry, sorry, around the feeding time, uh, and, it's, and it's what we saw in the plot before. Uh, in contrary, you see that the green line and the yellow lines that are the overfeeding and the reduced feeding res respectively, they show an increase and, uh, and decrease uh, in this asymmetry, suggesting that there is a symmetry that, is not, uh, that does not have the same direction. And uh, for the fasting uh, period, we, we see that there is no specific pattern of activity. Of, uh, of asymmetry. So this uh, result is very nice for us because we can quantify this uh, asymmetry we see and we can use this as reference lines uh, in order to control feeding uh, later. So this graph uh, next shows the duration of the increased activity for the different feeding scenarios. Uh, the lower the value shows the shorter, that there is a shorter period of uh, increased activity and we can see that when we have overfeeding uh, the duration of the increased activity is much shorter uh, than we have normal or reduced feeding. Uh, here, uh, the other behavior parameter we tested was the feeding behavior index. This is a parameter that shows how densely packed or crowded are the fish uh, during feeding. You can see uh, that this parameter is uh, um, it's, it's uh, very high uh, when feeding starts and as the feeding progresses it decre decreases, suggesting that there is a relaxation of this crowding. Uh, so we have the similar plot uh, with the first one, but now with the feeding behavior index. And uh, want to, what I want to show here is that uh, the fish, when feeding start, react. They densely, they go very densely uh, they, in high densities around the feeding uh, and the feed. And uh, here we can see this by this step. Uh, and there are differences between the different feeding scenarios. Uh, when we feed with reduced quantities, we see that the fish react massively and they have a stronger reaction, with the, which is depicted in this strong step and big jump. And this is not the case when we have normal feeding or overfeeding. And uh, of course, obviously, when we don't have feeding at all, there is no step, apparent step, seen as, as expected. Uh, the other thing we did is that we automatically grouped uh, the feeding behavior index into, two, into four clusters of behavior, as you can see here. If you focus on this uh, plot here, you will see that we have, uh, for the normal behavior, we have uh, one uh, black cluster that shows the pre-feeding behavior, the red and the grey cluster show the, the behavior during the feeding, and the blue cluster shows the, the post-feeding behavior. Uh, the interesting thing is that we applied this clustering also for the other feeding scenarios and what we saw is that there is uh, differences in the clustering. Uh, here, during the overfeeding scenario, you will see that this blue cluster, that is the post-feeding uh, behavior cluster, appears before the feeding starts, in the, uh, before the feeding ends, indicating uh, that possibly there is still the, the fish are much earlier uh, satiated. Uh, the opposite happens when we have reduced feeding, where we see that there are two the two feeding clusters, uh, the feeding clusters are apparent even after feeding stops. For the no feeding scenario, we see that the black cluster uh, remains uh, even at times that we know that the fish expect to 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 feed to get some food, but they don't. Uh, so also this clustering could be a possible tool for us to use to understand how the feeding was in a day and to control the feeding the following days. 
Uh, we also uh, run a change point analysis, it's a well-known uh, methodology for detecting, for automatically detecting uh, when, when feeding starts and when feeding ends in a signal of the feeding behavior index. Uh, the automatic detection of the feeding behavior index uh, of the start uh, enabled us to develop a model uh, that can uh, make predictions of the uh, feeding behavior index in future uh, seconds, in future time. Uh, so what we see here is we, we, did, we built a neural network and we trained it and then we tested it in the three different feeding scenarios. And uh, you see here with blue line the actual values of the feeding index and with orange line is the predictions we made after a few seconds. So, uh, as you can see here, these two lines are very close, suggesting that we have a very good tool for making predictions on how this feeding behavior index is going to change in the following seconds. And this is a very nice result because it, can, uh, it uh, gives, gives us the opportunity to have a real-time control uh, when the feeding is taking place, in fact. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to continue uh, noting, making a note that uh, the data that uh, Dimitra showed it are, for the first time, a time series of the actual behavior of fish in the cage <coughs> provide, provided with numbers. Because until now we have an overview of what is going on uh, with the fish in the cage, but we never have real numbers that get, giving us the opportunity to study and make analysis as Dimitra showed before. So <clears throat> can we use all this information towards control feeding uh, at two levels? One at real, at real time, as uh, Dimitra mentioned before with this uh, model, or <clears throat> by using an approach of evaluating what has happened today and adjusting and apply tomorrow. <clears throat> yeah, we are really close to this, and I would say that uh, with environmental uh, <coughs> parameters, we are already there because we have applied. We have uh, set some uh, thresholds uh, <coughs> with, in relation to the dissolved oxygen and to the temperature, and we define when we can uh, continue feeding or, or cease feeding depending on the environment. These are obviously uh, parameters that are user controlled, and for the case of the sea bus, we said that 50% uh, uh, saturation of oxygen uh, is for us a cutting edge point to stop feeding or, or the thermal uh, 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 <coughs> uh, variance between 12 and 28 degrees. So this is an uh, something that it is already applicable and it's a straightforward approach. Uh, the next and most important thing is the behavioral thresholds. Uh, we have shown you several uh, parameters that we have studied, particularly the fish speed, and Dimitra showed the symmetry of the motion, some uh, threshold values, and the duration of the ex excitation that can be used <coughs> potentially as uh, uh, control variables for the feeding. And we have also this uh, new uh, feeding index uh, and the clustering comparison that uh, we have shown and the predictive model that has been come on, uh, developed that <coughs> will uh, allow us to control the feeding. We are not there yet uh, in this, uh, uh, but we, we think that we are very close to be there. And the constraints for this, this type of, uh, of work is the long-term trials that are required and the large uh, data set. Actually, we are still running the final uh, experiment in, our, uh, in this project, and we hope that we are going to have the opportunity to get some uh, better results on this. So if I want to summarize a little bit what we have achieved, <laughs> we have developed a methodology to detect and monitoring European sea bass in cages. And we have applied also this methodology for the, the Atlantic salmon that has been tested positively. <laughs> we have uh, a method for automatic detection of feeding events. And we have uh, developed the feeding index uh, behavioral parameter that uh, give us significant information on, on the behavior of the fish during feeding, the round feeding, and also together with the speed of the fish. <coughs> give us a first estimation of sat satiation levels and uh, uh, thresholds that can be used. And most important is that for the first time we have integrated the fish behavior and environmental parameters in, <coughs> in one platform, and we have an unprecedented uh, interpretation of fish status and prediction for their needs. And <coughs> also we have achieved uh, defragmentation and digitization in a single system. And <coughs> to our knowledge, uh, this is the first time that uh, something like this uh, takes place. 
I would like to thank all the colleagues that participated in this uh, nice exercise uh, during the course of uh, the project. <coughs> Biosanor, EGM, Oxygard, Norse, and of course my colleagues at the Hellenic Center for Marine Research. And obviously we are ready to answer questions if there are. Thank you. So we do have uh, five minutes for questions uh, from the audience. I have one question that I have myself and also for the, our colleagues and uh, network that are following us on the live stream, we have a chat. So please feel free to put in any comments or questions that you have there. The, I think it is very impressive to see how all of the quantification of behavior now can uh, be tracked, recorded, up to the cloud, and decision making. But uh, the question is, how species specific is IBOS? So you've been using European uh, sea bass here. Is IBOS plug and play for any species that we can have in the world? Or how does it work if I want to use this for my species that I have at my farm? Uh, <clears throat> well. Uh the part for the environmental parameters, the monitoring of the environmental parameters, I think it's straightforward. It can be applicable uh, anywhere, everywhere. IBOS is a generic platform and to measure oxygen and uh, temperature and pH and all this stuff is uh, uh, the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. But uh, if, we come, if, if we come to the biological and the behavioral parameters, then we have to be uh, re actually very careful because each species reacts in a different way right. <coughs> and it has its specificities. And uh, maybe the parameters that <coughs> Dimitra has shown uh, before, the feeding index, the, the speed and all this, give us an indication of how the fish may behave, but certainly we have to do specific studies and sp mm. species specific studies. Spe the bringing the, in the biology. Yeah, exactly. Right. This is, this, uh, at least for me, is for sure. We cannot apply directly the, the findings of the sea bass in salmon, right. for example, not even in the sea bream. Right. So <coughs> environmental stuff, that's, that's plug and play. Yeah. That's easy. But the actual behavior of the species, that's where we need the, the biology and that uh, species know-how. Good. Uh, yeah, there was a question. Uh, how far into the day can the algorithm predict feeding behaviors? So we have tested this right now for, uh, let's say, a few seconds. A few and, seconds. Uh, mm. We can go up to some minutes, but uh, we need to train more the system in order to be able to have achieve it better, let's say longer um, uh, prediction. Mm. Yeah, or future, but to tell the truth, if uh, we are going to be extremely happy if we have stable and uh, coherent results uh, for half a minute. Yeah. Because yeah. this is already sufficient to control, to say <coughs> stop. Or continue yeah. This, yeah. because this is what uh, you need actually. Yeah. And if you if you go uh, half minutes in advance, then this is going to give you a huge uh, mm. uh, advantage in in, in hand. Great. Any any questions here from the uh, audience? Thumbs up. Everybody thinks <laughs> that this is a, a good innovation that can be helpful for aquaculture, uh, not just in Europe but also perhaps around the world. Great. Uh, our question is, what percentage of the fish captured on camera is considered sufficient to gain genuine insight? Uh, if I understand correctly the question, uh, um, the, the colleague is speaking about uh, f f cut, catching feed. That means we don't monitor the feed. Uh, so loss. which percentage of the fish captured on camera is considered? Ah, so I of fish. probably when you, you have to put in the telemetry uh, no. tags. Uh, the cameras. Uh, the cameras. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can detect, uh, depends on what you want to look for. If you want to look for the feeding behavior index, you don't go to the individual fish, but to the whole group behavior. Mm -hmm. So the cameras are located in a way so you can see, you can have uh, a very good view of the density of the population around the feeding. So right. that can help you mm -hmm. to estimate how this feeding behavior index changes over time. So you don't really need a specific number of fish, but mm. you need to have a very good view mm. around the feeding uh, place. Mm. Uh, and this is enough. Uh, for the speed, uh, you can, uh, we cannot obviously track all the fish because it's a quite densely packed population and our algorithms uh, detect, uh, let's say, 30 fish maximum uh, mm. per frame, let's mm. say, per, per, per a few, per, for, for a few seconds. Uh, but, uh, 
and that's the the best we have done so far and mm -hmm. we can see that uh, the, the the speed is highly correlated with what we also observe what the changes we see yeah. uh, so we think it's quite a good representation but we definitely always improve the system to get more and more fish and just to add on this uh, on what Dimitra said before uh, we we know that there is a problem if we have a huge cage and we have different feeding locations uh, and not only one feeder, but uh, a different feeding location. And then we just need to have multiple cameras to see how the fish behave uh, depending on the distribution and uh, uh, the feed that it is delivered and how they react in this delivery of it. Mm. There's uh, one more question before we move on, and that's uh, for the behavioral events you analyzed. Did you study if there was a conditioning from pre-study management? Yeah, we, we took uh, care about this, and that's why we have not uh, uh, considered uh, periods of uh, underfed or uh, overfed individuals more than uh, four or five days in order to be sure that there is no... Go uh, <coughs> uh, the fish are not accustomed to, to, to the new situation, and we repeat this trial after, uh, let's say, two or three weeks of normal feeding, Mm. So that we are sure that fish are, are coming back to, 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 to the standard classical uh, behavior that they have before we uh, expose them yeah. in, in, in differences that uh, <coughs> we have seen. So you mentioned in your last slide that this has been a big team effort uh, with the different collaborators that we've had. And uh, after lunch today, we're going to have the IBUS workshop where some of our other partners from BioOceanor, for example, uh, are going to uh, go more into the details about the, the different uh, integration aspects of cameras, sensors, uh, cloud infrastructure. So I think I you think that began. one more question came, but I have to make one comment. And yes, the, uh, please. It, it, it was indeed a nice collaboration between all the partners that I have shown there. And uh, I haven't mentioned because we didn't have the time, but I, uh, maybe I have now yep. uh, a few seconds to, to mention it. We have a very good collaboration with BioSanor analyzing for the first time uh, both uh, behavioral and environmental data. And we came up with something uh, that it was, for, for the biology point of view, was very significant. Because apparently, just correlating the two data, <coughs> we came up uh, uh, with a value for the critical uh, temperature that CBAS seems to have as an optimum. And this coincides with what we know from biology from years now, that mm. it's about 24, 25 degrees. Mm. But this came just from the analysis of, uh, of the behavior, of the motion behavior of, of, of the individuals mm. and the environmental parameters, which for us is is significant that this is <coughs> another issue that we have to explore further in the next project, most mm. probably, or uh, in collaboration with, uh, uh, with the companies, mm. but certainly give us uh, the opportunity to, to, to give, uh, to have a step forward. And obviously, this is something that cannot be done by one organization. It requires teamwork, and we are very happy to have, uh, to be a part of this nice consortium with all these good partners. The collaborative uh, aspect, very essential. Um, one more question, because there's a question on the cost of these technologies, cost of IBOS in developing countries. What are maybe the uh, bottlenecks there in, in developing countries? I, I don't think that we are ready now. We are in position to speak about cost yet. Mm. Uh, and this is something that does not, uh, uh, <coughs> is not only for HCMR to, to answer. IBOS is a platform that, as, uh, as we have just discussed, is, is a common platform, so there are more uh, or partners that are participating and uh, if, we, if we are successful, we are go I'm sure that this is something that we are going to come up <coughs> and this is not going to be the problem. To be solved. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks again, Nikos and Dimitra. Thank you. Wonderful. I'd like to invite uh, my colleagues Noel from Norse and Krista from Ovum, one of our collaborating uh, companies. Welcome. Yeah, just uh, we'll, we'll get, I can introduce you a little bit, Krista. Uh, tell me a little bit about your background and what you're working on and your con contribution to eye efficiency. Yeah. Uh, first of all, it's very nice to be here and so much uh, good uh, things have been mentioned already. I'm excited to see the results that will come uh, uh, from this work. Uh, I'm uh, in here working on uh, Ovum, and we have uh, developed the closed. Um, closed cage system uh, that we call uh, egg uh, or the egg mm. thus the name of them uh, for those who understand Latin yeah. <laughs> um, yeah and I've been working um, to yeah try to to get one of these demo demo 
tests in, in the egg so that we can test it out in, in the technology, uh, different type of technology and uh, also the open cage uh, with the fish that has been previously in egg, yeah. We're going to show that in a second. And Noel, uh, introduce yourself and your background and your role in eye efficiency. So uh, my name is Noel Garbi, I'm a research director of the Fish Biology and Aquaculture Group in uh, North, um, in the uh, Environment Department, Environment and Climate Department. Um, yes, my role in the eye efficiency is um, the demonstration, so in, the, uh, in, in a way, um, and luckily we have uh, Ovum <laughs> and uh, Krista with us to, uh, to discuss it today. So Frank uh, showed us the infrastructure and Dimitra and Nico showed us the Greek demo. And so now we're talking about the, the demo in Norway. And uh, basically, walk us through a little bit, Noel, uh, about the setup here. Yes, uh, I mean, it, yeah, it's a pretty uh, similar to what um, Nikos uh, and, uh, and Frank earlier have been discussing, so all goes together. Uh, the idea here, and this video shows uh, in HDMR pilots uh, and showing also how the sensors and how the cameras are, um, are situated in the open cages. Um, so basically we have, we're feeding uh, the fish we have camera sensors uh, in the cage and uh, looking towards the surface. Uh, the idea here is to send the data to the IBOS. So data means streaming, um, data from like fish behavior or environmental sensors will be there. So you will get an idea about water quality in relation to temperatures or um, yeah, oxygen level as well. Um, so this is really important and it goes directly to the IBOS cloud and then through machine learning, artificial intelligence. But also I have to point out also the expertise also in, in, in within the, um, the, uh, the aquaculture sector, meaning uh, fish biology and, and, uh, and uh, the technologies as well, uh, rearing technologies. Uh, it's very important to link uh, this aspect and then this goes into this fish talk to me, which we can call it also like the digital fish, uh, that will give us an idea about the um, this status of the fish. Uh, if the fish is hungry, the fish is stressed, etc. Um, and uh, this is a, a nice paper that was accepted like 10 days ago, was mentioned by, uh, by Nikos. So if you want to know more, uh, then just yeah, uh, read this paper and gives you a good example of how the, the technology has been used here. So great to get those uh, peer-reviewed papers out that really underscore yes. that this is uh, based on science yes. and a lot of quantification here. Yes. So we're, yeah, we're basically a uh, next step, uh, meaning uh, in any business on any, any um, yeah, any, any uh, proposition you make, you, you have like this uh, roadmap and one of these roadmap is the experimentation. Right, and then how uh, this idea works, and you need to assess, of course, and you, you go through pilots, you need to trials, and so on, and then at some point you move on, and then next step is um, is large scale and full production, and uh, and luckily uh, in this roadmap as well, it's really important to have partnership, uh, and we're lucky to have. Um, yeah, we're lucky to have Ovim with us, uh, OxyGuard, HCMR, and, uh, uh, and EGM, uh, basically, to put in place this in, in a larger scale. Um, and this is our plan. Uh, this will be demonstrated both in open cage and semi-closed containment uh, systems. Um, the idea here is to show that we are able to have a real-time streaming uh, and a storage of data uh, in using IBOS system. Um, and then, of course, using the uh, algorithms that were actually described by Nikos earlier and Dimitra, uh, and show that we could these algorithms are also applicable in uh, different species, but also different uh, technologies. Uh, so that's the uh, yeah idea. Cool. So as I understand, there's uh, two types of structures that we're talking about in this demo: uh, one open cage, and then one the semi-closed containment system. Can you tell me a little bit uh, about how Ovum is working with this demo here? Um, yeah, we we um, we want to see uh, how it works in both, uh, just to learn. Uh, as we are um, 
the company has been working with the, uh, with the system for 10 years already, but this is the first pilot, so there's a lot to learn, uh, not only with the, this new technology, but also our technology. So, so we're very eager to learn as fast as possible, as much as possible. Uh, so, yeah, we'll be placing uh, a camera and, and uh, connected it to the network to, to learn from the open cage, just next to the egg. Uh, and also using the existing uh, infrastructure in uh, the egg to 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 do the same and to see how how this works and to see the results and and yeah what 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 can we learn from it first uh, and foremost uh, and um, yeah several people have mentioned it already that it's this uh, knowledge that needs to be integrated from the people um, working like the operators uh, and if we want to grow and export the technology uh, we we can't send the operators with with the technology out uh, in all the cases at least so um, so that's what um, makes it important to 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 get that knowledge uh, connected to the technology so that it can follow the product because we have seen exceptionally good results in in the pilot but we also have very great people working uh, on on the product and with the fish uh, so, so this has to follow and be bound up uh, so that it can yeah, be exported to, together. I wasn't explicit, but of course, we're, when we talk about fish, we're talking about Atlantic salmon. Yeah. Yeah. So this is another species uh, that uh, training a bit of the behavioral algorithms on. Do we have a lot of data on that already, or do we need to do these uh, more pilot studies to learn how salmon are behaving? There is some data actually out, and then what's actually based on that will be uh, will be doing the demonstration and looking at the algorithms also mm. out of it. Of course, the behavior is different from a fish to another, and and uh, there will be some differences, of course. But we can also, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel, so we just, you know, use what has been shown, and then we adjust to to the species. Yeah. So this looks like from almost from another planet, <laughs> the, the ovum. And when I look at it, I, the first thing I think about is circularity. This is designed to be a circular system. Inma was talking more, uh, uh, before today about uh, circular, uh, how to quantify circularity in aquaculture systems. Um, Krista, can you tell me a little bit about the ambitions that ovum has for circular aquaculture? Yeah, um, we definitely want to fit in the circular economy as, as like a little missing piece. Uh, because we, if we look at aquaculture today, so there's a lot of outflow of nutrients uh, out in the oceans that we can't uh, get a hold of again. Uh, so we have the opportunity to, to gather this material and, and bring it back in, in the economy and um, yeah, shape new products and, and use them uh, to create value. Mm. And uh, tomorrow we have a workshop on this uh, waste to value uh, product and concept that we've been developing in efficiency and continuing that collaboration with Ovum on that uh, important topic. Uh, I have a question in the chat and also if there's any questions uh, in the room, uh, we can feel free. Uh, a question is, uh, is there any data on the percent cost of feed that we can save? Uh, relative to growth? Do we have any maybe indication about uh, maybe a hypothesis of how much we can actually save with this technology? I don't have like a number, but we can definitely save because I mean, we know that uh, the trend is continuous feeding, of course, right? By using the system and uh, you can actually target when the fish is ready to be fed, right? So you're actually ticking a lot of boxes of this, you know, uh, the. The, the, the environment, of course, because you're minimizing uh, the waste, you're minimizing like feed, but also waste in general. So then you're in a way um, uh, maximizing profitability. You know, it comes automatically, uh, but also the social aspect and um, and and uh, last but not least, the welfare of the fish, right? Because because like feeding continuously. So so. And, and just something to remember is like up to 70% actually is uh, of the cost is related to feed in the industry. So, so it's really, really important. Uh, if, if we feed, instead of feeding continuously and feeding twice like, uh, uh, like uh, Nikos uh, or like in some other partners do, 
then you definitely uh, reduce the costs if it's not like half. Yeah, 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 <laughs> so, so it's a lot. <laughs> and, and in addition to that, you will talk about it tomorrow, is the sustainability also of the feed. So that has been tested in, in uh, yeah, high efficiency. Yeah, high efficiency has actually been a, a very ambitious project, hitting a lot of these critical bottlenecks for sustainability for aquaculture. Um, a final reflection, how has it been to work together? Here we have Norris, a research institution, and Ovum as a business. Uh, all these good intentions, but of course we're we're in different sectors. Uh, can you maybe reflect on uh, the the possibilities, opportunities, but also the challenges? Want to start? I start. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it is it is challenging, of course, right? Like you said, it's different uh, industries, and we do more research, you know, R and D's and so on. So, so it's it's one thing when you when you do a trial in your own facility in a wet lab or like you know in the pilot scale, and it's another thing when you go, you know, large scale and full production because that also, I mean, we need to understand that that is business as well, and we need to make sure that when we uh, apply this new technologies or any value proposition, it has to work straight yeah. forward. And we need to consider the needs as well of the industry. The needs are different, and like especially at least my knowledge is in the Norwegian industry, and there are different needs, right? They are really they adapt a lot to technology. There's a lot that is going on in the Norwegian um, aquaculture sector, and then you need to really find what is the need. So it's almost like, uh, yeah. Iterative dialogue. Exactly. It's so a lot of dialogue. And um, I mean, I have really good experience so far <laughs> with Krista. We had re really good dialogue. But of course, there are challenges that are out of our hands. Um, so, so that we need to adapt and adjust. We don't have these big uh, research test centers full scale. So we're really dependent on that industry collaboration. Your final reflections, Krista. What is Ovum gaining from this collaboration? Well, um, we're learning a lot. I think that's, uh, and, and it is for all one of the priorities to, to learn quickly. As, like yeah. just, as long as we can learn quickly, we can go forward and, and uh, avoid a lot of uh, the issues maybe others are having. Um, and I think the challenge maybe for, for the industry is that we have a, like a very narrow focus that we have, we have to stick to just to be, be able to move forward and, and reach the goals. So. So then, then the research and, and development has to kind of yeah, fit into this narrow road uh, just because of limited resources, both time and capacity yeah, yeah. finances. So, so it has to be a good match because if it draws, draws the, yeah, the focus away, yeah. we, we can um, yeah, stand in uh, the danger of, of kind of not, not uh, moving forward in the fronts where, where we need to in, in order to stay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your reflections and good luck to the rest of the Norwegian demo. So finally, before our uh, little coffee break, we're, we have a story from Hungary. So I'd like to uh, bring to the stage my colleagues from uh, Hungary, uh, Tomas from Aquabiotech and Malta project coordinator, but also Hungarian and Balash Kovacs from uh, MATE, the University of Agriculture and Life Sciences in Hungary. So you guys have been working with uh, African catfish. Uh, Tomas, can you give me a little bit about uh, background about uh, catfish farming in Hungary? Uh, how big is it? How did it start? What are their ambitions? I, I would start with, in general, about the African catfish and maybe in general about the aquaculture in developing countries as well, because uh, we are end users of this project result a little bit as Aquabiotech because Aquabiotech is involved in many development uh, projects in Africa and, uh, and Asia. And what we see, uh, and this is also reflecting to the uh, question what just Nikos just uh, received before, that uh, in developing countries, uh, aquaculture 4.0 not necessarily means the digital technologies. Uh, but uh, but uh, we uh, aquaculture uh, 4.0 also include the, the, the genetic world, the new genetic methods, new new genetic uh, uh, technologies, and this have a, a greater importance, I think, in the in the developing countries. So we we consider the African catfish work in the in the project as a potential uh, uh, method and 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 use and uh, product what we can use in our consultancy activities in uh, developing countries. But African catfish, as you mentioned, also important in Europe, 
Uh, Hungary is one of the, the largest producer country, and uh, I have another hat on me now because I am a big fan of the African catfish as a consumer. I like to eat. <laughs> uh, I like to eat the products. Uh, the, the, the story started in, in Hungary at the end of the, the 80s when the, the economic and political change came in the uh, country and some scientists, some aquaculture researchers realized the potential in the species and uh, they became a businessman and they started to produce the, uh, the catfish in Hungary where we have a, a resource, we have a lot of geothermal water in the, in the country which is used mainly for heating and in greenhouses Ge and geothermal energy, geothermal energy mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, uh, and the water. And uh, the secondary use of this water uh, can be the African catfish uh, production. So the, the production started and is growing and, and growing year by year. So here's a picture of an African catfish and then the, their raised ponds. They, they, they produce the fish in Hungary in uh, tanks, in, in large tanks. Mm. Uh, because, and, and they can achieve a very high density because the fish can breathe air. Uh, after a certain uh, period, and uh, yeah, it's it's popular on the market because we had the European catfish on the market before, so the consumers knew the uh, the type of the fish uh, a little bit. And the most uh, frequent, most common form on the market is a fresh fillet mm. uh, in the supermarkets. So uh, we, you have been working also with uh, stakeholders, with fish farmers in Hungary. Balash, can you explain a little bit about uh, how you as a scientist and coming from university in, in Hungary have been collaborating and having a dialogue with these fish farmers? Uh, so <clears throat> the main idea is coming from the university to do <clears throat> Okay, so yeah. uh, the, the idea is coming from the university to, to develop the uh, genetic background of the African catfish mm -hmm. in, in uh, Hungary because previously, according to all knowledge, there wasn't any selection program in, in this species. Yeah. So, And uh, <coughs> the aim was to uh, selecting the fish for a, a low uh, fish meal containing feed to better utilization of this feed mm -hmm. in the... <coughs> uh, in the, this, uh, they develop a, a line which can be used for that. And uh, <coughs> African catfish is a very good uh, target for the, this uh, pilot uh, selection program because it, it has a very short uh, generation time. So how, how long is the generation time? It's, it's only eight, nine months. Eight, nine months, okay. So it's, it's uh, very good. So in this project we could uh, make a selection through three, four generations. So mm. the final generation that we tested was the first, fourth generation. Okay. And uh, the results are very good because uh, in, in flow stroke system, we could uh, reach 26% uh, uh, gain mm. in, in this, with this line. And mm. uh, <coughs> we also tested this line in, in rush systems because uh, uh, because of the circularity and uh, mm. we try to use uh, in, in uh, other system too and, and uh, in this case the this line was more successful because uh, the difference was uh, 30 percent and in this case we could detect the difference uh, between the feeds uh, the this line could uh, utilize much better the uh, lower fish meal feeds okay. than the, than the um, normal control line. So basically you're, you're saying that in developing uh, African catfish uh, for larger production you're getting good success yes. already with the genetic lines and mm. that uh, the new feed using mm. there was a microalgae in this feed. Yeah uh, we tested uh, four uh, different feeds and uh, this uh, fish utilized better all the f uh, uh, four but uh, th among that uh, was one uh, Con which contained the uh, algae from the high efficiency project. Mm -hmm. uh, so it also was a product, product of the high efficiency project. And, uh, and I think that microalgae came from here in Bergen from our Norse colleagues. Yes, yeah. the, this was published by the Norse colleagues. Mm. And uh, this uh, <laughs> feed was uh, much better than the control feed. The, the only difference was between the two feed was the 5% of algae. Mm. Which, uh, and uh, 
the difference in, in the glow was uh, around 5% again. So yeah, so, so really great results yeah. and showing that uh, also uh, the collaboration with the fish farmers. Uh, you said something that, here's a picture of you uh, yeah. presenting some results. You said that they were actually surprised with the efficiency yeah. results. How were they surprised? Uh, yes, that was a workshop for the African fish producers and, and the, this um, producer just realized that how efficient can be the selection mm. in this species, in case of this species. Mm. Because they thought uh, the genetic background of this uh, fish is weak, but it's not. So Strong it's possible to, possible to selection, right. select this fish. So they liked those results yeah, and saw the opportunities. They, like. uh, it, they, they like to, they want to use this uh, new line for, for their own production. So I understand that the production was about 5,000 tons of African catfish, but now it has uh, increased the past years, Tomas? It's, it, it's reached the 5,000 tons. This year, this year it's going to be more than 5,000 tons, and it's uh, increasing in, in Hungary and things like that. But not just in Hungary, but uh, we saw in Africa as well, in, the, in uh, we work a lot in uh, the countries around the Lake uh, Victoria. And there, around the lake, the most important species is a tilapia, as another species that we work with in the project. But uh, the areas farther from the, from the lake, uh, African catfish is an important uh, species for the aquaculture development in these countries. So we expect that the production uh, will increase uh, in Africa as well. Uh, very cool to hear about also this type of technology, looking at sustainable feed, looking at genetic lines uh, in countries where aquaculture is just really starting to develop uh, bigger along the lines of EU policy for a Green Deal and more food security in this. Uh, we will now take a coffee break, about 10 minutes. At 11.30, we start our policy roundtable where we also put this technology and these results into the larger policy frame. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys, welcome to the uh, to the last before lunch uh, part of our event. Um, we will be talking about uh, the legal and the political environment around us in EU and Europe in general, how this impacts um, our farmers, how it impacts the industry in general. Um, we'll be discussing obviously the taxonomy, Green Deal. We will be going a little bit further into aquaculture for zero and how digitalization will change our everyday. We see it in every other aspect of our industry. Absolutely major changes. Everybody who has an iPhone and like me wakes up with it in his hand and, and sleep, falls asleep with the, with the iPhone in my hand. We will understand and we have long since uh, understood that digitalization is going to change our everyday. Um, yep, I'm going to throw the card away. <laughs> There's a Norwegian entertainer who does that. I might even do that myself. <laughs> so in this project, this uh, Horizon 2020 uh, funded project, we have multiple players in multiple countries and in multiple positions around Europe and in multiple geographies, obviously, both in EU and EES. Um, we have worked on solutions to address some of the aspects and aspirations of, of the Green Deal and, the, and some of the um, digital aspects of, of how to deliver the information or the reporting to, to document what we are doing at any given time because there will be a lot of rep, uh, recording and analysis necessary to actually make a way forth. And in this Horizon 2020 funded project, this is a very important part of our dissemination to our environs, not internally in the project, but to the aquaculture industry in Europe as a whole. And that's why we are here. That's how we do it. We also have fun in this project. Um, to help us looking into this very demanding aspect of the industry, we have a great panel with us. We have Lisbeth Jess Plesner from Dansk Aquaculture Producent Organization. Uh, we have uh, Silje Sven, uh, Senior Quality Manager at Benchmark Genetics Norway, and Thomas Bartos, R&D Director at Aquabio uh, Tech Group in Malta. Uh, you've heard him before today. A um, little bit about the format today. Um, this is a subject with a lot of knowledge latent in people around us, 
and with a lot of opinions and a lot of questions. So I most certainly open both here on site and online. Come with your questions and comments and we'll take them uh, as they come up because we think it's very important that we speak and discuss and, and comment in context. Um, yep, that's it. We, that's how, how we'll uh, rock this show here. So I'm going to start with one quite general question and I'm just going to, I'm going to start, start with you, Lisbeth, and then we just go through it and just have a general discussion. And it is more than okay to digress from the question because, like I said, this is a complicated subject and we have a lot of apropos and <coughs> diversions. So my first question here is uh, actually the first question that popped up into my head when I heard about the taxonomy when that was going, coming on. And that is, given the taxonomy, uh, framework, let's give us the idea that taxonomy has already been designed for our industry. How can we use the present framework to move the industry ahead uh, towards increased sustainability or towards the goals that we have set forth in, in Green Deal? Lisbeth, would you care to comment on that first? Thank you for the question and hello to everybody. It has been interesting to hear uh, the presentation and the discussions. Uh, I think when or if aquaculture will be uh, part of the taxonomy, then uh, the positive things about that will be that uh, the taxonomy is for for uh, directing uh, sustainable investment, uh, and and in a way, the the aquaculture industry, if we will go for lots of farm and improve technology, then it also needs investment. And for that, the taxonomy can help us. Also, uh, I think the taxonomy can help the industry by <clears throat> highlighting uh, many of the good things and benefits of agriculture being a way of producing, uh, you know, uh, environmental and climate effective food. Uh, both and see this today, but also to to make some of the uh, improvement you also have presented today. Thank you. Uh, Celia, have any comments on that in general? How to use the current framework to to move ahead? Yeah, I can just I can comment on behalf of Benchmark Genetics. Um, as we are a supplier of Atlantic Salmon Ova to the global market. Um, and it's very important that the framework is um, taking into account all the different parts of the aquaculture industry and also in line with the production um, that is quite different in whole of Europe. Um, and as we know also in Norway, we have a big variety of producers and so it's really important that the framework takes into account this variety, mm. that it's possible also um, to be included uh, um, and it's easy also to adopt these goals um, because I think there is already done a lot uh, in line with the uh, sustainability goals um, but there will still be um, some issues that um, should be highlighted and I really also hope get, there's a good discussion um, so the goals are achievable uh, to implement for the whole variety in the aquaculture business. Thomas, uh, the present framework, let's put into context, frame it within our project. Uh, how can we co-opt the, the, the framework, legal framework, to, to move ahead with what we've been doing for the last four years? Um, yes, I, I think it's first we have to a little bit explain what is this taxonomy regulation because probably it's not uh, clear for everyone that this is a new regulation uh, initiative or it's already regulation accepted for some industries which uh, try to classify the different industries according to their uh, environmental performance and uh, will support these industries according to their environmental performance. So the regulation and the impact will come through the to money, through the funding, through the benefits. To, to this. So it's very important for the industry. Aquaculture is not yet uh, fully classified in this regulation, but I think it was a very good move 
from the Federation of European Aquaculture Producers and by Lisbeth and uh, her colleagues uh, in the Aquaculture Advisory Council, that they, they were proactive and outlined how the industry uh, can uh, be in line with this new regulation. And I also would reflect what uh, you just said, that uh, we have to take care about the uh, different, uh, the, the big uh, differences within the industry when we, when we uh, go, uh, when we see this. And this is what we did in our project as well, that I think in terms of sustainability and environmental performance, the, the different types of aquaculture technologies, industries, species, and need, need different solutions. And this is what we did in the project, that we, we worked with really high-tech uh, solutions, uh, which were presented uh, today, but we also went into the low-tech direction, uh, let's say a little bit, and also work with the waste. So for example, what, what, what I think for the, uh, what, what, how the industry should should react that the, the higher value species I'm sure will have a very wide range of uh, solutions methods uh, answers uh, for this but uh, the the low tech species the cheaper the low value species they have a more limited uh, resource to answer the challenges of this new uh, regulation so uh, we really need to support these these industries as well absolutely. Uh, there's always one question that pops in my head when I hear about <laughs> green, uh, green investment. And it's sort of a red flashing light for me, and that is um, there is a danger or, or there's a possibility that we will see increased greenwashing in, in this industry as every other industry. Would you <laughs> care to comment sort of as the first one out? And I think also that's the basis to have a certain framework. Mm. Uh, so it's not just for each company to set the framework themselves, but we need um, um, a standard that um, we can um, implement in our own businesses and also for the different businesses to sh share knowledge and also best practice um, how we can achieve this as a whole. So, yeah, really important. Lisbeth, care to comment on greenwashing? Um, also, so you can compare different, uh, yeah, now we're talking food production, different food items between each other, so so you can avoid greenwashing and, and probably make the right decisions. Uh, but it's uh, difficult items, yeah. And I think still the taxonomy, even, go a little bit back to that then we have had in FEAP the European uh, <clears throat> Producers Organization uh, dialogue with uh, the EU Commission about the taxonomy and they are not there now to implement uh, aquaculture in the taxonomy I think if everybody or if the countries and EU want in uh, aquaculture to to uh, mm. develop and increase the production in, in the European countries, then it would be needed some investment, and there we could use the taxonomy as a tool, also for tool to avoid greenwashing. Yeah, yeah. I want to come back to uh, yeah. another aspect of the taxonomy, but I just want to like, would like to hear Thomas if you have a comment on the greenwashing <coughs> aspect. Yeah, well, I, I cannot add anything more <laughs> than the others, but uh, I think I would highlight that that it, it needs to be a kind of uh, industry framework which defines the, the framework, uh, how can we be in line with the, with the regulation and, and uh, not the companies uh, should uh, lead the, this role. I, I, industry organizations mm. should, should lead this. And just to comment also, it's sure. so important to, with transparency. So you can go behind the numbers and yeah. really see uh, the differences be between the companies because when each company are setting their own framework, then it's not possible to, to really say what's the differences. So we in Benchmark have work, had worked with uh, the, putting up the over footprint for several years now. This is the third year. And as long as there's not a standard there, it's uh, we find the numbers and we're discussing it with the customers, showing uh, per, per production that we deliver to the customer, but it's really hard when you don't have the, 
the setup um, the framework as a standard in the whole of the business so this is a important work it's also different if you have good numbers in one place where do you put them in context with everything else mm. because you have to count count your numbers in, in a similar way and report them in a similar way just to be able to to uh, see where you are you have a yeah. just wait a second thomas uh, there is one from the yeah, I wanted to put these into context. Uh, also, in some other results we've gotten from the efficiency project on social acceptance, uh, because we have been looking at the whole of the value chain. So this morning we were looking about the the science in industry, but we've also asked uh, consumers and people who eat aquaculture pro uh, products in Norway, in Germany, and in Hungary about trust. Uh, and what we see is that uh, there is a relatively high trust in the primary food producers, the farmers and the, the small food producers. 57% uh, in Norway, 64% trust in Germany, 66% in Hungary, so relatively high. But that trust decreases the further closer to the consumer we get with uh, retailers, food industry. With retailers, 9% uh, of the Nor 300 Norwegians that we surveyed um, consumers have trust in the retailers, 9%. Uh, it's a little bit higher in Germany, 43% and 33% in Hungary. But uh, I think this gets also a little bit to the greenwashing in that we can do a lot of work with R&D uh, to get sustainable uh, technologies, but we have to make sure that value comes through the whole chain uh, here, and we can talk about labels, the uh, and the issue of labels being a connection for the consumer from the science and from the trust in the producers to the consumer. So that that's I think some interesting results that we got in these uh, analyses that we did on social acceptance of the technology. You had a comment just to the transparency. Yep and that accessibility is a key element of the taxonomy regulation and probably I was also can be a, a system, a technology which can support the farmers to be in line with this requirement of the, of the regulation. And um, I think all, all developments on this area will help the industry to, to prepare for this. Okay. Dominic? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Come in even a little bit close there. Okay, I can talk here. Okay. No. This one? Yeah, okay. This one works. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, coming back to the EU taxonomy, uh, I think one, so we are talking about uh, what it could uh, uh, imply, but for me, the biggest implication in, in is when many sectors now has their standards. Uh, linked to the uh, EU taxonomy and uh, aquaculture not having that, it is about the access to investment because we know that big investors are going to uh, use this EU taxonomy to decide also on what project uh, and to, to, to support. And the aquaculture not having that is putting the business in a bit of a peculiar situation in competition for big investments. So I think it is one of the m major things also to put in place, uh, apart from uh, the greenwashing and so on that you have been mentioning, but uh, the access to investment in competition to other is something very important. And related to uh, what uh, some things of we are doing in efficiency. So tomorrow we are, we are going to work about uh, the waste to value and created value from waste as one of the mechanisms. And one of the mechanisms linking the aquaculture sector with other sectors exploiting possibly the waste to produce other things. And, and for me, the, uh, the aspect of the EU taxonomy and access to investment is also to be pursued there because it's about uh, showing to the investor how they put, put money that can contribute to the uh, valorization of and, and value added on, in different sectors jointly, aquaculture with another sector by using, uh, for, example, for example, the waste. So I think this, uh, this aspect will become very important in the future. Excellent, thank you. Um, I have one other spin-off question from the from the, um, the the taxonomy aspect, and maybe you two are best to answer it. I'm not sure. But I'll just jump into that. Um, now we have seen taxonomy has already impacted on agriculture. Um, are there any sort of aspects of that that demands more from from fish farmers today do you already have to report on something because we know we have logistics we have agriculture and we are quite dependent on both 
are we in a position today where we have to report on taxonomy related aspects from other industries? Anything you know about Celia? Well, we already uh, report um, on a wide uh, variety uh, in line of the GHG protocol uh, since we're a UK based uh, company. So in that case, this will not be a problem for us. And we have also made an own system, IT system, which we developed since we have a quite special production um, mm. in benchmark. So this will not be a problem for us. Uh, but as I said, there's a huge variety. Uh, and since there's not a specific framework uh, for the businesses, um, this needs to <laughs> be included mm. um, for the different uh, aquaculture businesses uh, overall. So, it, yeah, we need some time, even though time is scarce, to implement this. Yeah. What I was thinking about, do fish farmers today um, have to meet some reporting needs related to taxonomy in other sectors like logistics or agriculture? Well, yeah. Uh, yes, you ask if they, they, the fish farmers today, need to go for other uh, mm, criteria in the taxonomy for agriculture and transport. Um, and in a way, you know, agriculture is part of the taxonomy, and as far as I know, also the transport sector. But I'm a little bit uh, doubtful. But as um, mm, but I think. The taxonomy can really help aquaculture, but it's very important. Also, and Celia said that it will, you know, we need some, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, yeah, the screening criteria, which can uh, implement all the differences in the aquaculture industry. And I also think we need to be very aware of that, that the taxonomy is for for finance and investment, and together with those, we also need uh, environmental, social standard that can be also what was said today, labels, uh, other things. And, and in, in this setup, it's all based on the EU Green Deal and the Farm to Fork. And there, the Farm to Fork say that we need to, and I think that's important, redesign or food systems, and there aquaculture is, is uh, quite good in many <laughs> many of the criteria we need to be in in this framework today. So therefore, it's, it's very important to to have some uh, transport criteria indicators so the consumers, the buyers can compare the different uh, products against each other's. Yeah, but important to have the taxonomy for the investment, but also uh, labels, standards, other things for for uh, for having the right <laughs> knowledge about the impact of 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 aquaculture. Um, I want to switch attack a little bit, um, and I want to discuss a little bit. Now we've talked about sort of the big picture here and how it can impact. I I want to take another attack and discuss how it will impact when we come to it. Are we capable of meeting the demands of our environs in terms of, of better documentation and, and so far? So there is a lot of reporting that needs to be done. Uh, and we all know what that means actually in hard work. And, and we know that further back when you, when you had intern control coming online in Norway properly, smaller fish farmers in Norway didn't have the the human capacity, they didn't have the systems in place to meet that regulation. So if you look at European agriculture in general, it's, there's a lot of different, you can say you have a lot of different levels of organization and technology. So is the aquaculture industry in Europe capable of meeting the demands? Lisbeth, would you like to comment on that to start with? Yes, please. I saw. <laughs> Very good questions. And I think uh, the the industry is not ready yet. Uh, not all, the whole industry, but many of the bigger companies they are ready. And we also have this had this transition 
I can talk from Denmark and the industry or the countries I know, but the transition had been, you know, small, one man, two, three employees, and then two huge companies. They have a, a standard <laughs> employees and other things. So I think that uh, the industry is moving that direction. So and also for the for the farms for the industry to attract investment, that will be. Of course, the user companies, and they will be capable of that. Uh, as we know, that many farms uh, business uh, have been going for certification, global gap, BAP, uh, ASC during the last five, ten years. It's quite new, and that's also we call it a kind of paper tiger. You know, it's also a lot of documentation, a lot of papers, and transparency and improvement all the time, and and and. In Denmark, the Danish company in the beginning, it was really hard, <laughs> steep learning curve, but actually they did them. And I know you also in Norway, very, very long in this aspect and very good in, in doing that. So, yes, yes, we are on the way. <laughs> but there is, there is uh, there's a huge gap uh, between, and, and you actually know quite well the difference between bigger companies, international companies where you work. And you also have knowledge and, and about the smaller companies in Norway. You s yourself probably see the c difference in capabilities and what systems companies have in place. Yes, and uh, you mentioned um, certifications, and I guess um, Global Gap is quite familiar mm. for the whole range of um, businesses in Norway. Um, and I think this standard has lifted us up to a uh, very good level um, and it's dragging us to uh, set improvements every day in our work. So I, th I think this certification has also um, uh, been a very good um, criteria um, to grow in the aquaculture business. Mm. So, and as we speak, we have also implemented ISO 14001 in uh, benchmark, uh, we will include it in the whole of the business, um, and it's not just setting um, um, setting fine words um, on a nice paper. You all also need to set goals and objectives, and you need to put number on those goals. Sure. So, yeah, measure I think this is a very good measure, yeah, to yeah. put in place uh, right. to help us achieve where we want to be. Thank you. We have a comment from the sideline here, please. Yes, it's a requirement, not a comment, but <laughs> I would like to first of all introduce myself. I myself uh, my name is Balazs Gregosic from Hungary, from Vitafort. Uh, Vitafort is a feed producing company in Europe uh, and in, in Hungary, of course, and we are present in many uh, countries in, in Europe as uh, worldwide as well. And we have a very interesting uh, uh, slide in this uh, efficiency project. Uh, we did uh, um, fish uh, experimental in Laos. And uh, for this side, we have some uh, feed uh, industry background and some, uh, uh, some ideas about this uh, topic, but you're talking about it. And Dorothy asked me just a little bit, add some comments. Uh, very shortly, I would like to uh, give you an, uh, a picture uh, why is so uh, important and I can talk about n uh, now just about the Hungarian uh, side of it and a little bit for the European Union but not worldwide so to to understand this whole uh, situation which is to be honest uh, a little bit far from us from the daily work what we are doing feed pr feed producing etc it's nobody uh, dealing with uh, um, uh, in 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 the real life, but everybody is uh, preparing for that. But it will be an, uh, a big issue. And uh, when we're talking about it, big issue means for the companies, the SMEs, that you have to pay for that. So uh, until until that point, nobody will take it seriously. So uh, to understand it uh, uh, very shortly, in 2000, uh, uh, comparing 2021 and 22, the world feed industry was uh, uh, decreased only to only 0.25 percent globally it's it's not a significant number uh, but if we focus on europe it was more than six percent which is now it's a it's a visible number 
and if you if you see the different uh, animal species, then uh, the uh, the the biggest uh, decreasing was uh, the ruminant, of course, and the ruminant. It's uh, because uh, the rumen function and the emission and the methane uh, emission, it's very important. Uh, and uh, this is a point where you understand that uh, why the, uh, the European Union is so focused on this topic. Because this number is not worldwide number, it's European uh, Union uh, number. And uh, after pet food, <laughs> pet food was, by the way, the highest uh, uh, decreasing number uh, accordingly to the feed production uh, in the Europe. Aquacultures were the second one. So uh, you, you can see from the tendencies now that uh, the the uh, the uh, the high uh, effect of the environment. Uh, if we're talking about it, the agriculture sector, then it's very focused on on the on the dominant way. So. And therefore, uh, now started uh, to focus uh, the Hungarian uh, companies to prepare for that. Which means that, for example, our, uh, our uh, bank, bank background is KBC, the Belgian bank uh, group, uh, started uh, uh, to, to discuss with uh, the uh, thousand uh, most significant uh, partners uh, in Hungary. And uh, they have a very uh, strong plan for that, which means there are different levels. Uh, I mentioned that uh, there is a plan that uh, uh, above uh, a certain uh, number of uh, uh, employees of the company and, uh, and turnover of the company, until 2024, you have to uh, make uh, different uh, quotes and uh, 2026 and seven and uh, until uh, 2030, you have to be, uh, and they call it uh, fit for uh, 55 program. Maybe you heard about that. That means that you have to 55% of the emission, uh, you have to be uh, uh, done. And until 2050, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, 2050, uh, yeah, you have to be neut uh, neutral of the of the climate uh, point. So it, vis it will be very, uh, very hard. Uh, and what we can see now, if you are not able that, then you have to pay for the quote. It's, it's, easy, uh, it's uh, quite simpler. And, and for example, now we can see that uh, uh, they started, uh, for example, Lidl and Aldi, uh, German companies in Hungary, uh, they start to a little bit remove the, the swine production from, the, uh, from the, the stores, which means that can maybe uh, uh, substitute by fish food. So, so that, that's, that's the way how it's, uh, it's working at the moment. So that's short comment what I can add if it's what's good. an impact that we have to we have to account for i have we have literally one minute and 10 seconds so i'm gonna put forth a little question that we can probably discuss for a week um and that's mostly to our fish farming partners here we were talking about green loans and green investments and we were talking about the difference of the capabilities of smaller companies versus bigger companies to to document what they're doing. And, and is there then a danger that the big companies will get a really, really much better position to achieve future growth through easier access to green loans and leaving the smaller companies in the wake and not giving them a fair possibility to grow? So Lisbeth, would you care to comment on that first? I can try. Yeah, you are probably right. There, um but also in a way, yeah, for the for the smaller company, also the idea of what is a small company. We see often that smaller company, it's expensive for them to go for global gap or in C certification. So in, in that way, because you are paid the same if you have a farm producing 2,000 tons of fish or if you have a farm producing 25 tons of fish. Uh, so, so of course, with all this documentation for, it can be environment, but also uh, social workers, uh, welfare, whatever. So, so in a way, it it divided. But I think it is everywhere. But smaller fish farms, they maybe can make niche production. Still, the ecological um, 
framework in EU is is uh, extensive farming. So they can go another way. They can, uh, yeah, they can uh, buy fish in on local market or, or, or other things. So I think you need this division because I for all the documentation for if you need the taxonomy and certification, whatever, it, it, it would be both uh, economical and also uh, will take too many man hours for the smaller companies. And so uh, you are probably right. <laughs> Anything to add to that? Yeah, no. Will the smaller get a tougher life getting funding? Or well, really hopefully funding? not. Hopefully, hopefully not. not. I do agree. Let's hope that this system is uh, open for the whole variety. Yeah. It that it's work. possible for everyone to achieve the goal set and the framework. Excellent. Yeah, I'll just... Thomas, you had a... Comments, yeah. yeah, I have a comment here that I think it, it would be necessary to... We see now that this will be a long-term program. We heard from, from Balazs as well, it's a long-term plan. So I think we have to start on a European level, a kind of program for the smaller companies to be able to in line with this. This can include trainings, this can include uh, research and development and innovation activities, uh, which is our area uh, a little bit. Uh, so we have to be prepared uh, for for this uh, on a on a whole industry level, and uh, and the whole EU level uh, as well. So I, I think now we have uh, a kind of uh, harmonized implementation of the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, Fisheries and Aquaculture Fund, uh, from this period. Uh, so let's let's include these uh, these elements into into these programs on a national level as well, and uh, provide all the support for the small farmers as well to to be in line with these requirements. Absolutely. And this was all we have time for today. Uh, thank you all for your contributions, your questions, and the, obviously your answers. Special thanks to Lisbeth, Silly, and Thomas. Thank you so much for for spending time with us and contributing. Um, my final words here today is that I hope that the taxonomy, uh, the Green Deal, and we who sit here can become a part of the tide that lifts all boats. So have a wonderful day. Thank you. <laughs>